The coast of British Columbia is one of the planet's most vibrant and ecologically diverse marine ecosystems. Here the waters are home to thousands of dolphins, the highest concentration of killer whales in the world, and one of the last vestiges of the grizzly bear and the spirit bear, otherwise known as the Kermode. All of this is supported by the wild salmon. Six different species of Pacific salmon proliferate these waters. Every year, millions of wild fish return from the open ocean to the rivers of their birth. This ancient cycle has created one of the planet's most dramatic and dynamic ecosystems, feeding and supporting hundreds of species, including human beings. Wild fish in British Columbia supports a $500 million commercial fishing industry, as well as a billion dollar tourism industry. For thousands of years, West Coast First Nations have relied on the return of the salmon for survival. Today, this connection is still very real and still very much alive. The food resources found within our territory define essentially who we are as people. We're proud to tell you that we're fish eaters and clam diggers. You know, and these are some primary staples of food for us in the Broughton Archipelago. What we have in the Broughton right now is a regional collapse of virtually every species of marine life you could picture. I mean, let's make a list. Pink salmon, chum salmon, herring, ooligan, little neck clams, butter clams. And the only thing new in the region is the introduction of open net cage aquaculture for the last 20, 25 years. The salmon farming issue is attracting attention and in the last few years, the Salmon Coast Research Station has begun operation in the Broughton. Here, biologists from many universities come to conduct various research projects on sea lice interactions, the effects of slice on the environment, and other farm-related impacts. One of these researchers is Dane Stobel from the University of Victoria. Dane has teamed up with local fishermen to study the impacts the farms are having on the flatfish in the area. In recent years, local fishermen have been documenting strange lesions, tumors, and eye parasites in the ground fish around the fish farms. What is clear is that these are indicators of a polluted environment. Meet Alex Morton, a biologist who has been living in and studying the Broughton Archipelago for over 20 years. Once a whale biologist, Alex now focuses her studies on the impacts your farms are having in her backyard. Nearly every day she's on the water, sampling juvenile fish, counting lice levels, and doing plankton toes around your farms. This year, Alex applied for a permit to net some of the young wild salmon fry and transport them past your fish farms an attempt to save some of the few remaining fish from sea lice. The little fish come right along the shore and they come around that far corner there and into the little bays and work their way all the way along until they're right in behind that fish farm and they hold here for a period of weeks. So even though this fish farm has treated with the drug slice and the number of lice have gone down, because I know I've been looking at the plankton around this farm all winter, I've seen the lice go down, but because there's probably 700,000 to a million fish in there, even if there's only one louse per two fish, it still adds up to billions of lice larvae produced every few weeks. And these swim out into the water and they are designed to find a salmon. And that's the whole problem, the collision between these lice just billowing out of the farm and the little fry that come along and run into those clouds of lice. Last year I saw the river closest to me, the Viner River, die. I've been studying drugged farms now for four years. It's not working for the wild salmon. It's working for the fish farmers, but it's not working for the wild salmon. Slice can work. Um, however, we're now dealing with a, um, 
we're dealing with a product that's not licensed in Canada. Uh, we're dealing with a product that um, that wipes out not just lice, but um, all, a great many invertebrates, uh, many of which form the basis of the food chain. And so uh, it's entirely possible that while the sea lice are eliminating the salmon, the treatment for the sea lice are wiping out the rest of the food web. Marine Harvest. In your public relations literature, you state that you now have a sea lice management plan for the time when the juvenile wild salmon are migrating past your farms. Your strategy, however, is profoundly flawed. For all of your sites that hold adult fish during this time, you are treating with the drug slice. You are relying on a drug which is a neurotoxin and not yet registered for use in Canada. It is approved only for limited use on a case-by-case -case basis through Health Canada's Emergency Drug Release Program. Your plan relies solely on this loophole, using an emergency measure to hold the sea lice epidemics at bay year after year. This is clearly not sustainable. Slice is only effective for 10 weeks. You treat your farms in January or February, but come May, the slice has long since worn off, with two months left to go in the wild salmon oat migration. In parts of Europe and South America, sea lice have already evolved a resistance to slice. Despite your sea lice management plan, the researchers in the Broughton have still consistently reported that over 80% of the juvenile wild salmon have a lethal load of sea lice by the end of May. Suddenly in the last few days it's become really clear that the fish that have gone through the Broughton are now going out into Queen Charlotte Strait are heavily infected. I've looked at over 9,000 fish in the Broughton this spring, and in general, they all had very few lice. But then we get to now, what's happening right now, and suddenly the numbers jump up and all of the fish have lice. These numbers are telling us about the wiping out of a run of pink and chum salmon. Better life through drugs just never works. The lice may become resistant. Maybe that's even what we're seeing this year. Slice is not working. How long do you think you can pretend you have this under control? You will be responsible for the extinction of entire runs of wild salmon. Oh, well, that's that's the that's the that's the insanity of all of this, right? Is that sea lice were were shown to be. Um, have exactly the same effect on on European wild Atlantic salmon and European sea trout. Well documented, our data fits hand in glove with 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 those data from from Europe, and so this has been on the records for more than a decade. The scientific community again has spoken with a with a unified voice in Europe. This has happened, and in fact must happen. Just basic first principles of ecology, right? If you bring this number of potential hosts together, right, you will have disease problems. We, we predicted it, that would happen in British Columbia. It's now happening, just as it's now happening in Chile. So if, if one were to take all of this research that's been published to date um, and sum it up into, into, into one you know, piece of information, it is that industrial scale salmon farming in British Columbia equals the extinction of wild salmon which then means the extinction of our wild ecosystem, and it's going to happen in the next decade. The, the, the level of confidence we can have in these conclusions is, is extraordinarily high. Uh, as with uh, um, any scenario where there's a lot of money involved, there will always be manufactured um, contrarian arguments. However, one only needs to look at the weight of evidence that uh, on one side you've got the entire, literally the entire independent scientific community. On the other side you have a small handful of scientists with vested interests in the industry. All arguments that support the business as usual argument have a vested interest in business as usual. <laughs>